Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine from University of Adelaide Environment Institute, but I'm also a citizen scientist for iNaturalist and for FungiMap. And I'd like to introduce you to the rest of our team for tonight. So two of South Australia's longest running and award-winning citizen scientists, Robert and Rosalie Lawrence, and one of our emerging scientists who's specialising in citizen science, Wendy Warren. Now together as a community, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Kaurna people, which is where um, we're zooming in from. And they're the traditional custodians, of course, of ancestral lands of the Adelaide Plains. And we acknowledge your deep relationship to country and respect that past, present and ongoing connection to country and culture. And tonight in our session, we want to talk about culture in citizen science. And this central question around how might we harness citizen science for innovation? So note that subtle, it's not innovation in citizen science, but we're really interested in how can we harness citizen science for innovation more broadly? We want to do this in four ways. We want to look at innovation and why does it matter in citizen science, some trends in citizen science innovation, and then we want to propose five principles. So this is a seed of an idea that we want to share with you and explore. So five principles, talking about that three, three case studies, and then looking at what next. And this session, this little session is dedicated to the budding innovators amongst us. So those of us that have got some big ideas, but aren't so quite sure about taking the next step. So innovation, why does it matter? Well, as we know, the UN's Global Biodiversity Report has warned us that we're hurtling towards mass extinction of a million species. So for us, this is the why of our citizen science. We need to find new ways to connect everyone with nature and we need to transform connection into protection. We need to discover innovative ways. And we believe that citizen science may be one of the most transformative. So we love hearing about the different types of um, citizen science that's being represented tonight. But for us, this is where our passion is. It's about protecting our planet. I'm gonna tell you about some different ways that we're doing that with citizen science. But we wanted to look around the world and see what are some of the innovations in citizen science around the world? So we did a little bit of a lit search. And this is what we found. And some key trends that were coming out of that are that technology does continue to drive innovation. And we've heard some of that tonight already. And there's a bit of this shift beginning from describing patterns to testing interventions with citizen science. And this third one, that it turns out that in times of transition and change, like global pandemics, people sign up for citizen science. And it'd be great for us to find ways to continue that effort, of course. So what about in Australia? Well, we know that Alan Finkel proposed at an AXA conference, I think, was that two years ago? Three principles for citizen science, which we find really helpful. Solid science, powered by people to make the world better. And we believe that these three principles for citizen science are also really powerful for citizen science for innovation. We'd like to add two more, harnessing synergies and perseverance. And just a reminder that innovation can be those massive paradigm shifts, but it can also be the tinkering at the edges. So let's start with solid science. Let's start with thinking about problems. And we've heard some great examples of, of that happening through our other projects tonight. So starting with the problem, really understanding that problem. We wanna start with fungi map as our first case study. So the problem for fungi map, when fungi map started was that we have an estimated 50,000 species of native fungi in Australia. They're weird and wonderful, all sorts of different shapes. They're important, but they were in the too hard basket. Only 24% had been described. So the problem was how to teach people about fungi and how to get them to start to share records. 
So Fungi Map started. This is our innovation timeline. We haven't got time to go through it in detail, but I just want to highlight that the yellow ones in particular are the ones where we've been able to partner or influence government. And one of the most, I guess, milestones, important milestones in our innovation journey has been going from people sending in photographs and Excel spreadsheets to find it that was really time consuming and we needed to find another way. So we spent probably about three years trying to work out how to resource an app. And eventually, thankfully, our naturalists caught up and we were able to make that transition. So you can see that in February, we made the transition. By December in the same year, we had 19,000 records in the FungiMap project. And what you can see here is we still have about the same number of records coming in every year, but it's shifted. So now that it is um, virtually entirely coming in through iNaturalist and that transition has happened, thankfully, very smoothly. And it really has transformed. So the second principle that we want to talk about is harnessing synergies or joining the dots, you can think about. And for that, I want to hand over to Robert and Rosalie. Thank you, Jasmine. So, um, we have been involved with Wild Orchid Watch uh, right from the beginning because that's where we started. So back in 2012, um, we were chatting with people about improving orchid identification and we wanted a better way. We had a vague idea and it was really, we're only talking about South Australian orchids. Um, then we came across uh, an identification in North America called Go Botany looked good and we had a software engineer who could help us but it failed so that caused us to just rethink what we're doing and we increased our vision we weren't going to be just south australia we we're going to expand it to the whole of the country and it wasn't just about identification we were going to make this the collection of quality research data because there is so much unknown about the orchids so that's where we um went to um, we then talked with lots of individuals, researchers, botanists. We discovered there was a need. People wanted it, but everybody was too busy. We even did a national survey and we had over 160 responses. So we knew we were on the right track. Then we run a, a grant in turn from the Adelaide University. And from that, we've developed an app and a website. So some lessons that we learned. People are important and you don't need to be the expert. I mean, we were novices when we started. We just wanted to learn about the orchids. We weren't researchers, we not in a government department or a university or anything like that. We've learned a lot, but we've also learned to keep in touch with novices because they will tell us the things that we've overlooked, sometimes the very obvious things. The second thing we learned was get involved and network. I mean, we talked to everyone, even if they weren't interested in the orchids. We still learned from them. We learned from other citizen science projects, such as Echidna CIS. We listened, and the most frequent area of concern we heard was the security of orchid locations. So we made that a priority to address. Another lesson was flexibility. We allowed our ideas to evolve and to change. Our initial vision was small and didn't include the collecting of data. And setbacks, well, we used them to refocus and refine our vision. Go botany failed, so we thought about what we really wanted. We talked to UniSA IT staff and we just didn't communicate very well to them, and so that didn't work out. But when we went to visit Ben Sparrow from Turn, we took with us a software engineer and boy, that made a difference. So we seized opportunities. When we first heard about the grant, my thought was, we're not ready. Roberts, let's give it a go. We had no backing, we had no university behind us or government department, but we gave it a go. And that grant was for half a million, FY. So be adaptive was the other lesson. Back in 2012, iNaturalist was still in its early days. But partway through the grant, our team discovered that iNaturalist had concepts that we needed 
but we also had things that we were wanting to develop that was on their wish list. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really natural collaboration to put the two together. So where are we now? Well, the plan had been to hold workshops across the country, but of course, COVID-19, everyone knows what happens. So in September, we had a minimalist launch. We held four workshops in the Adelaide Hills because our launch was based around workshops. From that, we have 298 members, 127 active observers and over a thousand observations. And that's increasing daily. So even though COVID-19 did impact upon our launch and stopped us from doing the workshops across the country, we can still say we are where we are because we tapped into a need and networked with people. Thank you, Jasmine. Fantastic, thank you, Rosalie. So principle number three, and let me pause and say, the reason we're talking about principles is because for us, they're like guiding lights. So there's some times in citizen science where it's really hard to know what to do. I work with an endangered wattle called Wibbly Wattle. And we've looked at how to do citizen science. And at the moment, it's not the right time. And it's been reflecting on why is that? And for us, it was the principle of the strong science. It could be fun to have a citizen science for Wibbly Wattle, but the science question is not there to make it a priority at the moment. So that's why we're talking about principles because we find that they can be really helpful and we really hope that they can help others too if we think about them together. So our third principle, powered by people. So back to our fungi map case study. You can see here in our iNaturalist fungi map project, we are collecting a lot of records, but what's important here is the number of people that are engaging with it. So while we're getting similar number of what we call research grade, so really high quality records, about the same as what we were getting before, in the past there were two people identifying those records. Now we've got a whole community involved in it. There's conversations, there's a whole lot more interaction. And on top of that, we're getting the same number of records coming in. So double the records, but with those new ones are new people getting involved, taking photos, finding out about fungi in ways that just wasn't happening before. And it's about the people powering that. But what's different is that there is much stronger feedback loop now, thanks to iNaturalist, than what there was before. And that that feedback loop is driving. It's the feedback loop that's powering people to put in more records. And the other thing is that for FungiMap, our biggest innovation may be what's happened this year thanks to COVID. We've gone from being based in the herbarium in Melbourne to now being a virtual NGO. So we are all around Australia and we meet by Zoom. And absolutely, as people said earlier in Slido, citizen science is innovative because it's inclusive. And that's why we've got four of us tonight because we wanted to demonstrate Zoom is fantastic. These online forums are so good. It makes it inclusive. We can have people all around Australia together, all around the world, all contributing in together. So that's why we wanted to do the four because it's just a way that we can be much more inclusive than we used to be. And our fourth principle, perseverance. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Jasmine. Hey all, my name is Wendy Warren. I'm coordinating the project called iBandy. So in iBandy, our aim is to train citizen scientists to help them discover more habitat for the protection of bandicoots. iBandy is a local pop-up uh, pop citizen science project. We train people in this wonderful little app called iNaturalist, which helps people to identify and then document the natural world. We train people how to use this tool and then we encourage them to help us protect bandicoots by recording their observations of the world. For a project powered by people, the sudden loss of this face-to-face -face connection this year has posed some tremendous hurdles. As restrictions were becoming tighter and tighter, people were unable to do the very things that the success of this project depended on, you know, such as going outside and attending training sessions. So instead of throwing in the towel, we chose to explore some of the creative solutions um, to find uh, ways around these restrictions that were placed upon us. We had to face the reality and that was that this project just wasn't going to continue in the format that we had originally planned it to. And I can say it really didn't. Mm -hmm. So we found it to offer online training and we focused more effort towards an online presence. 
we worked within the confines COVID had set for the project and we were able to engage the community and build connection despite being apart. Um, we used breakout rooms where people were able to chit chat with one another and find common ground. We also used these breakout rooms to get people practicing using the app by finding living organisms around their house, such as pot plants or their own pets and sharing them um, through the app itself. Now, back in April, we believed that we were being really restricted by, um, but by looking back, we can now see that by persevering and by collaborati uh, creatively collaborating, we've been able to practice innovation and expand to an online audience, which we might not have otherwise reached. We have now been able to train nearly three times the number of citizen science we had set out to train in the beginning. And the project's not over. We already have trained 85 new citizen scientists where we had originally only set out to train 30. Citizen scientists have collectively produced nearly 200 observations of bandicoots, bandicoots and their habitat. And we've gotten our message out to an audience of 385,000. So through sheer perseverance, iBandy has not, over managed, not only managed to overcome these hurdles and met our key goals, we have accomplished far more than we had set out to do. And these restrictions, you know, they, it turned out they weren't actually that restrictive at all. It forced us to consider new techniques and approaches that may have otherwise been completely overlooked. And our determination throughout this period allowed us to reach more people than we had even anticipated. So through perseverance in uncertain times, we've been able to engage even more like-minded people to join us in making a positive change for the world. Um, back to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Wendy. So our fifth principle, to make the world a better place. Hopefully you've been able to hear how through our four projects that we're involved in, we are helping to protect some of our most endangered species. So our key messages, just in summary, this question about how might we harness citizen science for innovation? We need to harness innovation to transform the protection of our planet as well as all the other wonderful things about citizen science. And we, we really believe that citizen science can unlock transformative innovations. And we've talked about these five principles. So these are the ones that we, um, you know, that came to us as we were reflecting on it, but we're sure that you've got some as well. So hopefully there might be some in the chat. If there's not, we'd love to hear your thoughts on principles and we'd love to explore this further. So if you're interested in principles for citizen science for innovation, we'd love to hear from you. And just lastly, remember we talked about this little session that we were wanting it to be for budding innovators in citizen science. Now you might be seven, you might be 70, you might be brand new to citizen science, or you might have a lot of experience in citizen science and you're thinking, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure about that idea. Maybe that's going a bit too far, I don't know we would say do it. We'd love to hear your idea and um, we'd love to support you with it. So go for it. And thank you all. Thanks again um, to everyone behind the scenes for SITSI Oz. Thanks to our awesome partners, Australian government, state government and Trees for Life. Thank you all. And here's the contacts. We'd love to hear from you.